Hello YouTube. Today we're going to look at causation. Uh, now causation is a, a huge topic in philosophy. Uh, there's a, an enormous literature on it. Uh, but in this video I'm going to focus specifically on certain sceptical arguments that have been raised against a um, position known as causal realism. Uh, now I should say first of all that we're focusing specifically on what's sometimes called efficient causation. So this is where one event brings about another. The firing of the gun brings about a person's death, the golf ball colliding with the window brings about the shattering of the window, um, you know, and, and, and so on. So that's the kind of causality we're talking about. Uh, causal realism then makes two claims. First, that uh, causation is mind independent or objective. It's a feature of the external world. Uh, it existed in the world from the beginning, long before any sentient creatures came along, and it will continue to exist once we're all dead. Uh, of course, causation presumably exists in our minds as well. I mean, I, I suppose, you know, thinking about things mentally can cause things, but it's, you know, it's 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 an objective feature, right? It's it's, it's mind independently part of reality. The second claim is that causation involves a kind of necessary connection or special connection between the cause and the effect, right? Causation is more than a mere correlation of events. Um, so, you know, we've, there's a lot of metaphors that sometimes go around, you know, we can think of causality as being a kind of um, metaphysical glue of the universe, something like that. But the point is, there's more to causation than mere correlation. Now, I, I, think, I think causal realism is basically the common sense view of causation. Yeah, this is how most people think about it. Uh, but perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, philosophers have raised a number of arguments against this common sense view, which uh, I just want to outline in this, in this video. Now, as many of you probably know, the classic skeptical argument against causal realism goes back to David Hume. Um, Hume's argument is one of the most famous in all philosophy. Um, I'm not really going to say anything new about it, so if you're already familiar with it, you can skip this part, but I'll briefly go through what Hume has to say. So first of all, uh, recall that Hume is an empiricist. Uh, for him, uh, all our concepts, all our knowledge are ultimately derived from sense experience. And this uh, led to the famous idea of Hume's fork, right? So the, um, the claim here is that, you know, all propositions can sort of be sorted into two legitimate areas, right? There are propositions concerning relations of ideas and propositions concerning matters of fact. The propositions concerning relations of ideas are those that are knowable a priori, right? They're, then they can know them through logical deduction or through analyzing meaning. Uh, so think about propositions like one plus one equals two, or all bachelors are unmarried, or every triangle has three sides. We don't need to examine the world to have knowledge like this. We can, we can just learn it from the armchair, as it were. But the, the point is that these propositions are necessarily true. They, they could not fail to be true. They're true just in virtue of the kind of logical relations or just in virtue of the, you know, the meaning of the terms. Uh, on the other hand, matters of fact concern statements about the world. So think about all ravens are black or the sun rises every morning or metals expand when heated and so on. Uh, these propositions are only contingently true. They could be false. Um, they can uh, be known only through experience. You can't learn that all ravens are black just by thinking hard in your armchair. You can't learn what time the sun rises you know, by performing logical deduction or anything like that. You know, you need to go out into the world and experience it. So with this kind of background in mind, Hume analyzes causation. And the first question is, what does causation involve? Well, Hume points out that to say that A causes B, well, this first of all requires what he calls a, a constant conjunction between A and B. Uh, and we, we expect that this conjunction will continue to obtain. So the idea is, Whenever A happens, B follows. Whenever one billiard ball moves towards another and strikes it, the other billiard ball moves. Um, so that's pretty simple, but it's clear that constant conjunction isn't enough. Uh, so we can imagine all sorts of cases here. Let's say your alarm goes off at 7 a.m. every morning. And let's say you have another alarm which goes off shortly afterward. So in that case, you have a constant conjunction, but you wouldn't say that the first alarm causes the second alarm to go off. 
So in addition to constant conjunction, we need what Hume calls necessary connection. Um, and so this is basically just an assertion of the second point in causal realism, right? There is more to causation than mere regularity. When one event causes another, there is a special kind of connection between those events. So constant conjunction, right? That's fair enough. We, we, we observe constant conjunctions of events. But what about this idea of necessary connection, right? Where does, where does the idea of necessary connection come from? What is it that, that justifies the claim that A is necessarily connected to B? So one option is to try saying that it's a matter of logical necessity, right? It's, it's a relation of ideas in Hume's terminology. You know, maybe we can, you know, do we sort of know the, that A is necessarily connected to B through, through logical analysis? Well, uh, it seems pretty obvious that this can't be right. Hume uh, asks us to consider any case of one event causing another. Well, in, in any case that you think of, it's conceivable, it's logically conceivable that it could have gone differently. Uh, from the knowledge of A alone, we have no way of knowing what the nature of B will be, or even whether there will be any uh, other event at all, right? So one billiard ball hits another, and we expect the other billiard ball to move in a particular direction. But, but logically, you know, conceivably, anything could have happened. Perhaps the second ball would just you know, shoot straight up into the air, or maybe it would expand rapidly, or spin, or disappear, or maybe just you know just nothing. Maybe the first ball would hit it, and then nothing would happen. Um, you, you, you know, there's no there's no way of, of of logically deriving what will occur, given the cause. The cause that is never logically implies the effect. Um, so any any inference from the cause to the effect is based on experience. Um, the only way to infer what will happen to the second ball is on the basis of past experience of balls hitting each other, or at least uh, objects relevantly like balls hitting each other, right? So yeah, I, either we've seen billiard balls interact before, or we've seen things uh, that are relevantly like billiard balls interact. I mean, maybe we've seen what happens when two beach balls hit each other, for example. And so that's what allows us to uh, kind of understand what will happen when two billiard balls interact. But the point is that it's only by experience that we discover causal powers. Causal claims concern matters of fact, not relations of ideas, so they can only be justified through experience. So, um, do we get the idea of necessary, of necessary connection through sense perception? I mean, do, do we in some sense observe the necessary connection? Well again, Hume says no. Whenever we perceive any case of uh, apparent causality, the experience, the actual sensory data, is simply of constant conjunction. You have no sensory impression of necessary connection. So I mean, just think about, uh, you, you know, think, think about, say, a ball moving and then hitting another, right? But all you see here is, is the motion. All you see is one ball moving and it touches another and then the other ball moves. That's all. Right. Similarly, if you strike a match and hold it to a piece of paper, you see the paper burning. But in, in none of this do you ever see or hear or feel the necessary connection between these events. It's, it's, just, it's just particular events occur in a particular sequence. So a final possibility that Hume considers is the suggestion that, well, maybe necessary connection isn't perceived in the external world, but maybe it's perceived in ourselves when we move our bodies. So I form the desire to move my arm upwards and this causes my arm to move. Maybe we uh, experience a, a necessary connection between the operation of the mind and the movement of the body. And then of course you can assume that objects in the external world interact in the same way. So that's where the idea of necessary connection comes from. But still, uh, Hume denies that we perceive any uh, necessary connection here. I have no idea how I actually move my arms, right? I have no idea how the internal power of my mind actually works. I mean, one way to think about this is to consider that I can move my arm, but I can't move my liver, say. But, but why, right? Why do I have control over some body parts and not others? Well, that's not something that's accessible to consciousness. 
Or consider the case where uh, I become paralyzed in my arm. Well, if I then try to move my arm, my mind performs precisely the same operation as it did when my arm wasn't paralyzed, right? I mean, the, the experience of sort of trying to move your arm is the same either way. It's just that in one case, your arm does move and in the other case, it doesn't. So, you know, the, so, so we don't sort of experience that necessary connection between the, the willing it to move and the arm moving. And I think Hume's point here is, I mean, I think he's pretty, pretty much correct and you can be supported by the, the modern scientific discoveries, right? We, we now uh, know that the, you know, the kind of causal chain from the mind to the body, right, involves the brain sending signals down nerves, but that required scientific discovery, right? We, we clearly have no experience um, of the actual causal chain from the mind to the body, so we don't experience the necessary connection in ourselves. So Hume concludes that necessary connection is really what's going on is that it's just a matter of subjective certainty that constant conjunction will continue. Uh, we perceive particular cases of constant conjunctions and as this happens again and again and again, a, a kind of habit of the mind is formed so that when we view a cause, we come to expect the effect with increasing confidence, right? We, we, we naturally expect the effect just in perceiving the cause. Um, so A causes B, what's going on there is we perceive A and as a result of this habit of the mind, we are led inexorably to the idea of B. And, and you know, with each case of perceiving a constant conjunction like this, this subjective certainty grows. And this subjective certainty is where the idea of necessary connection comes from. When we assume that necessary connection is somehow in the cause itself, is, is, is sort of in the world itself, that's a psychological projection. It's similar to how uh, we might assume that the smell of an apple, say, is in the apple itself. But of course, when you, you know, when you think about it, it seems pretty obvious that, well, the smell is a psychological phenomenon. The, the smell, you know, smelling an apple, right? That's something that the apple causes in us. That sensation is something the apple causes in us as a result of you know, the particular structure of our noses and our brains. Um, so to, to, to think that the apple somehow has, has a smell in it, in itself, is a psychological projection. And Hume thinks that the same kind of thing is going on with necessary connection. We're just projecting a subjective sense of certainty out onto the world. Necessary connection is not mind independent, so causal realism is false. Now, uh, there are a couple of, uh, I guess, points we might want to note about this argument. I mean, the first thing is that Hume's uh, argument here is framed in terms of causation as constant conjunction. Now, you might think that this is rather dated because, of course, nowadays people often speak about probabilistic causation, where one event uh, does not, needn't necessarily lead to another, um, but only increase its probability. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that on the quantum level, for example, events are uh, indeterminate and probabilistic. I don't really think that this is much of a problem for, for Hume. I don't think this really alters the force of his argument. The, the real point he's making here is that there's a special kind of connection between cause and effect, right? I mean, and, and, and it's, it, this connection is precisely what, what justifies the distinction between causation and mere correlation. But the, the point that Hume is making is right, that this connection, this special connection is not derived logically Right? It's not perceived uh, in, through the senses in the external world, and it's not perceived in ourselves. Right? And so there doesn't seem to be sort of anywhere, for, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be any way in which this, this notion of a special connection can be justified. And probabilistic causation doesn't really help with this point. Now, of course, in, in the modern sciences, we do have a lot of new means of distinguishing between causation and mere correlation. There are techniques like regression analysis, for example, that are used to try to identify genuine causal relations. Um, again, I, I don't think any of these methods really address Hume's problem, right? I mean, even in Hume's day, a distinct, people knew there was a distinction between 
causation and correlation, modern techniques allow us to better identify possible cases of genuine causation and rule out mere correlation. But they don't really uh, address this metaphysical problem raised by Hume. So, I mean, my point here is that we do have a much more sophisticated understanding of causation than Hume did, but we don't seem to be any closer really to explaining just what the special connection between cause and effect actually amounts to. And that I think is, is really where uh, he, you know, the, the force of Hume's argument lies. Okay, so that's uh, David Hume, as I say, very famous argument in philosophy, but there are a lot of other uh, arguments against causal realism. Um, so a couple of other arguments are given by Bertrand Russell in his paper on the notion of cause. Uh, Russell held that the concept of causation uh, it, it was deeply confused and it should be eliminated from proper philosophical and scientific discourse. Now Russell gives essentially two arguments. First there's the asymmetry objection. Um, so Russell points out that the ca that causal relations are asymmetric, right? Be being a cause is different from being an effect. You, you can't swap them over. To say A causes B is not equivalent to saying that B causes A. Uh, and importantly here, the causal relation is asymmetric with respect to time, in that causes always precede effects. Um, so it's, it's temporarily asymmetric. And actually there are some philosophers, I think, who suggest that there could in principle be uh, backward causation, where the, the effect happens before the cause, in, in some you know, very strange scenarios. Um, but you know, even in those cases, there's still a, a kind of temporal asymmetry because the point is that the cause and the effect you know, couldn't, be, couldn't be swapped over. However, fundamental physical laws are temporally symmetric. Um, you know, the, the point is that you just, in, in the case of a fundamental physical law, what you have is an equation. Um, yeah, such and such uh, equals such and such. And in, in that kind of case where you have the equality symbol, you can just swap over, um, you can you know, swap over the left and right terms. So Russell gives the example of you know, the, the law of gravitation, right? We can apply this to two bodies to determine the gravitational force that each exerts on the other. But Russell says there's nothing like a cause or effect here. There's, there's simply a formula. As um, Richard Corey in Causal Realism and the Laws of Nature puts it, he says, if the state of a system at time t determines the future states of the system according to these equations, then it will equally determine the past states of the system. So given the current state of the system and given the laws of gravitation and other laws, we can derive what the system will look like at a later time. But similarly, we can derive what the system looked like at an earlier time. We can derive both the later and the earlier states. So there's, there's no um, temporal asymmetry here. So, you know, we might say that the gravitational force of the sun causes the Earth to orbit it or something like that. But this causal claim is not entailed by the physical law itself. Causal claims are asymmetric, physical laws are symmetric. So according to Russell, there is no place for a causal relation in a properly scientific worldview. Now notice that this argument um, leads to a rejection of causal realism, only if we assume that all true claims are reducible to physics. Ultimately, the only truths are those that are expressible in fundamental physical laws. So this is a very strong kind of reductionist physicalism. Uh, without this, this kind of reductionism, then we could hold that, you know, we can hold that insofar as other branches of science like biology and geology make claims that are not entirely symmetric, well, that's enough to vindicate the symmetry of causal claims. Um, and I think you know, this very strong kind of reductionism tends not to be so popular these days, so um, I suppose this argument is not taken as having quite so much force. Perhaps a more powerful argument given by Russell is the intervention objection. First, uh, Russell claims that causation involves causal laws. Uh, and I think this is fairly reasonable. So the idea is just that you know, the, the basic form here will just will be the claim that say, when events of type A occur, events of type B will occur. When a person drinks 
X amount of cyanide, they will die. When a golf ball collides with a window at a certain velocity, the window will smash. When a match is struck against a particular kind of surface, it will burst into flame. Just these sort of gen generalizations like that. Uh, now, a law along these lines requires that uh, A and B denote events that can be repeated. It must be uh, the case that a law has more than one instance, or we're not really dealing with a law at all. We're just describing a single sequence of events, and that would be trivial. That wouldn't be a law. Um, and, you know, there doesn't really seem to be any problem here because we assume that events are repeated all the time. I strike a match and it produces a flame. Well, many people have struck many matches and produced many flames. But notice that when we say that striking a match is something that can be repeated, we're restricting our attention very closely to just one small part of the world. We're focusing just on the match head, right? We're just thinking about a match head being moved across a certain surface. Now, if you consider a more comprehensive state of the world, right, then actually repetition doesn't occur. So if you consider the current state of the Earth as a whole, with a particular distribution of fauna and flora or whatever, well, that's never occurred in the past and never will again. So we don't have repetition there. So what this tells us is that causal laws can't be general and comprehensive. All causal laws must focus on very specific parts of the world. But now here we run into a problem, because if we don't include a large amount of background information about the general state of the universe in our causal law, then it's it's always possible that the, the general environment could be such as to prevent the effect or that something could, could intervene to prevent the effect. So take the case of the match. Well, there are all kinds of contexts where striking a match actually won't produce a flame. Suppose there's no oxygen or there's a very strong wind or it's uh, raining and a raindrop hits the match just as you strike it and so on. We can only know that the purported cause will produce the effect if we know a great deal about the environment where the purported cause occurs. So in the statement of a causal law then is actually gonna to have to give uh, quite a comprehensive statement of, 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 the, of the world, right? So, so when we say that A causes B, right? It's not good enough just to say that you know, striking a match is A. We need to then list the general features of the, uh, the wider environment, right? In our antecedent. So basically, we have uh, have a dilemma. If the causal law right, doesn't specify the general state of the environment, then it's going to be false. So you know, if if A doesn't detail the state of the environment, then the law will be false because there will be a host of cases where A will not produce B. On the other hand, as we describe more of the environment, the probability that A will be repeated decreases, decreases to nil. In which case. Again, it's not really a law, it's just a description of a particular sequence of events. So that's a bit of a problem. Uh, a similar way to uh, the same kind of conclusion is the exactness of science. Um, science doesn't just tell us qualitative facts about nature, right? You don't just get, for instance, that, well, if you release a stone above the ground, then the stone will fall. Okay, we don't just give those qualitative facts. Scientists try to quantify exactly how fast the stone will fall under particular conditions. So how fast will a stone fall? Well, you know, it depends on the density of the air, on the strength of gravity uh, at that particular point. And you know, of course, the, the strength of gravity uh, differs quite subtly at different parts of, of the Earth's surface. Um, so you know, all, of this, all of these different things are gonna have an influence. Science is precise and exact in you know, in, in the sense that it is going to care about all of these things that have an influence. We don't just want to state the effect, we need to quantify it. So a stone falling at you know, 9.5 meters per second, that's a different event from a stone falling at 9.8 meters per second. And the trouble is that once the cause has been specified in enough detail that the effect can be calculated in a precisely quantified manner, it becomes increasingly unlikely that the cause will be repeated. Um, yeah, I mean, in fact, yeah, again, right, if, if you just take, if, if you were to give enough detail, if I hold a stone right now and then release the stone, if you were to provide enough detail about the environment, 
then that probably never will be repeated. So you know, Russell basically suggests that science doesn't actually aim at discovering uniformities like A causes B. Right? It, it instead aims at, at precisely quantifying um, the, the antecedent and the, and the consequent events. And that is going to block you from uh, you know, d d deriving these um, general regularities. So uh, that's basically the intervention objection. Right, uh, now I'd like to briefly discuss three arguments that are discussed by uh, Anjan Chakravarti in his book A Metaphysics of Scientific Realism. Uh, these final three arguments are quite similar to Zeno's paradoxes, if you're uh, familiar with those, so maybe of some interest for that reason. First, there's what Chakravarti calls the continuity contiguity objection. Uh, this objection starts with the assumption that for one event to cause another, those events must be contiguous in time. Uh, no time can pass between the cause and the effect. Why? Why must this be the case? Well, because if not, then following the cause, it seems that in principle something could intervene to prevent the effect. And this would uh, violate the necessary connection between the cause and the effect. Right, so, so the effect must immediately follow the cause, and that way it can't be blocked. Uh, now, there are, of course, um, causal chains. Uh, if, you, you know, if you have a line of dominoes, the first domino falls, and then a minute later, the final domino falls. And we would probably say that the first domino falling caused the last one to fall. So in this case, it looks like cause and effect are contiguous. Uh, but notice that what we have here is a causal chain between the first and the last event. And, and, and we assume that each link on the causal chain is contiguous in time with the next. So, the problem is that time is dense. Um, between any two instants of time, there are further instants. So for any event A and B, take the instant at which A terminates and the instant at which B begins, there are further instants of time be between those two points, which means that A and B are not contiguous, and so A cannot cause B. Now obviously, um, the quite controversial claim here is that time is dense. Uh, you may have heard uh, in physics, you know, there's, uh, there's this thing, Planck time. Planck time is often considered to be the shortest length of time that has any meaning in physics. It's the, it's the shortest length of time that it's even in principle possible to measure. Um, but that's not to say that it's the shortest duration of time. There may be shortest durations, it's just that we can't measure them. Uh, and Chakravarti suggests that actually in physics, it is often assumed that time is dense um, in, in the sense that you know, there is no shortest duration. I, I don't really know physics, so I'm not uh, qualified to comment on that. But um, you know, I think that that's one obvious way to attack this argument is, is to um, deny that time is dense. But that's the contiguity objection. Second, there is the regress objection. Um, so. Uh, you know, let's say that A causes B, but now focus just on A itself. A is an event, and as such it will involve changes over time. Uh, let's say the golf ball causes the window to smash. Well, the first event is the ball, the ball flying through the air and colliding with the window. But now this can be broken down into shorter events. The ball moves through the air, the ball touches the window, the ball pushes against the window, the ball goes in and the window deforms, and so on. There's a long sequence of events that makes up the larger event we're labelling A. Now it's pretty clear that the earlier parts of A cause the later parts of A. The ball moving through the air causes the ball to touch the window. And notice that if the earlier part of A causes the later part of A, the earlier part of A can't be the direct cause of B. The earlier part of A is just the first link on a causal chain. So the question is, what is the direct cause of B? And this is where the regress arises. So let's say we designate some part of A, call it A star, as the direct cause of B. But now there will be a causal uh, relation between the earlier and later parts of A star. At the, uh, uh, and that means that the earlier part of A star 
can't be the direct cause of B. So it must be the later part of A star, call it A star star, right? And the problem arises again here, okay, because the A star star is going to have earlier and later parts. So we, we originally proposed that A causes B, but then in searching for the direct cause of B, A ends up being diminished indefinitely. And so it seems that B has no direct cause. Uh, now, obviously, like the contiguity objection, this objection rests on the proposition that time is infinitely divisible, that time is dense. So again, an obvious response would be to attack that premise. If time is not infinitely divisible, then uh, actually, eventually, you're going to get to a point where you, know, you, you kind of can't divide it between the earlier and later parts. And so you could then just designate that as being the direct cause. Um, but if time is infinitely divisible, then you know, we still have this problem to deal with. OK, a final problem for causal realism is the demand for a causal mechanism. Uh, and unlike the previous two objections, uh, this doesn't rest on any controversial claims about the metaphysics of time. So consider the case where A is some uh, static, unchanging state of affairs, which then brings about B. So suppose that the universe has been in state A completely unchanging for 100 years, and then this causes B. Now, there's something very bizarre about this scenario, right? This, this just doesn't seem to make sense. Given that A is unchanging, right, it has no element of change in it, how can it possibly bring about some other state? And you know, why 100 years, right? Why would it bring about B after 100 years rather than some other period of time? There's something very bizarre here. The trouble is that this scenario can be can, can be generalized. But now suppose that rather than uh, 100 years, A obtains only for one year, and then it causes B. Well, you know, obviously this doesn't make any difference. And now suppose that rather than one year, A holds only for one second. Or suppose it holds only for one nanosecond, or whatever, right? You can make the time arbitrarily short, it makes no difference. Uh, and even if we say that there is a shortest duration of time and that A occupies just that shortest duration of time, again, it's not at all clear how something unchanging for that duration can produce change, right? So the, the problem that this objection is pointing to, I guess, is that it just doesn't seem that any causal mechanism is really possible. There, do, there doesn't seem to be any way to connect up causes and effects uh, in such a way that the you know, the necessary connection is is, is vindicated. Um, and you know, I mean, this kind of thing is perhaps responsible for the fact that the, there's we, we fail to give any clear description of how causation is supposed to work. There's a lot of metaphors for causation, but none are ever developed in any real detail. Um, so we've spoken in this video about causation as involving necessary connection between causes and effects. That's a phrase popularized by Hume. Uh, we also talk about causes bringing about effects or an event has the causal power to give rise to its effect. Causation is sometimes described as the cement of the universe or the glue of the universe. There are causal links and causal chains. None of these terms, when you think about them, are actually all that clear. And, you know, that. I suppose that perhaps the fundamental concern here is just, well, how does how do you get from a, a kind of unchanging event, regardless of how short that event is, how does how could that bring about something else? So um, those were some of the problems that have been raised uh, against causal realism. Um, as I say, a common sense view, but you can see that it actually faces a lot of uh, quite tricky puzzles. Um, so I just wanted to outline those in this video and um, that's all for now. Thanks for watching.